I'm Michael Feinstein. Welcome to In the Archives, the Great American Songbook Foundation Archives. I'm going to speak about a beautiful, wonderful human being who is a friend of mine, Mitzi Gaynor. Mitzi Gaynor embodies the best of what show business is about. She's an incredible human being and a legendary performer who has touched every aspect of show business, and we are lucky that she has chosen to donate a good portion of her musical archive to the foundation. She actually has donated all of her musical arrangements to us and is in the process of donating other materials as well that relate to her career. Because when we collect artifacts of a particular performer, we want to have a big picture, a broad picture of who that person is. And something that they may consider inconsequential, such as a newspaper clipping or a little card that sat on a table of a nightclub or some other little bit of ephemera, which is something that was meant to be thrown away but somehow survived, uh, can help to tell the story of a career. And when it comes to Mitzi Gaynor's career, it's a very broad career. She started her time in Los Angeles as a stage performer appearing at the Civic Light Opera in Los Angeles in musicals and operettas and was often a featured dancer. Uh, her name at that time was, was Mitzi Gerber. And then she was discovered by the movies and was signed to a contract at 20th Century Fox and made a whole slew of movies at Fox, even though a lot of the films were uh, forgettable, not because of her, but because they were sort of light, frothy confections that didn't show her off to her best advantage. If you watch these entire films, sometimes they can be a bit cloying. But when you take the musical numbers that she did at 20th Century Fox unto themselves, choreographed by one of the great Hollywood dancers and choreographers, Eugene Loring, you see a certain level of genius that isn't always evident in uh, choreography and in execution. And Mitzi Gaynor is one of the true legends of the dance world. And uh, Mitzi enjoyed her time at Fox and was very grateful for the uh, collaborations that happened there. But then uh, she left Fox and she was a bit all at sea because she was out of a movie career for that moment, even though she had made a very successful film, There's No Business Like Show Business. Uh, and decided to start performing in nightclubs. Well, she suddenly put together an act that went to Las Vegas that became one of the legendary nightclub acts and eventually led to her doing an annual television special for which she received I don't know how many Emmys, but created new careers for herself, not only as a live entertainer and toured and toured and toured with a troupe of male dancers doing a show that was hair-raising in the best sense of the word and then these television spectaculars that happened once a year. And that led to the creation of a great deal of music. So here in the archive, we have music from every aspect of Mitzi's career, uh, as well as music from her most classic film appearance, South Pacific. And so this music, as I said, really is the story of show business. So it's appropriate to show you Mitzi's arrangement of the Irving Berlin classic, There's No Business Like Show Business, which was her hit film at 20th Century Fox in the 1950s that co-starred Ethel Merman, Dan Daly, uh, Marilyn Monroe, and Johnny Ray. So this is Mitzi's arrangement. And you could hand this out to a band right now, and they could play it if you give them the right downbeat. So that's what's amazing about this music, even though it looks old and tattered because it was well used in live performance for many, many years. It also is something that is still viable. Now, this little envelope here that says Gershwin, Vernon Duke, relates to a record album that Mitzi made in the late 1950s for the jazz label Verve. Verve Records became the home for Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong and other jazz giants. But Norman Grants recognized the vocal talent of Mitzi Gaynor and made two albums with her for Verve, one being Mitzi Sings the Lyrics of Ira Gershwin. And how perfect is that? that her materials from the Ira Gershwin album come here because of my association with Ira Gershwin. 
So in this envelope are the original copies of sheet music of the songs that she was considering recording for her Ira Gershwin album. And this is the original sheet from the Ziegfeld Follies of 1936, a song called Island in the West Indies, because Ira Gershwin told me that in the 1930s you could literally buy an island in the West Indies for $10, and he was so struck by that fact that he wrote a song about it. Oh, there's an island down in the West Indies, $10 can buy. Away from Rubens and from Lindy's, neath the tropic kaleidoscopical sky. So Mitzi recorded that. And then other songs. Uh, this is Spring Again, which is an obscure song from the Goldwyn Follies. The hit song from that was Love Walked In. And Mitzi was the first person to make a commercial recording of Spring Again. From Porgy and Bess, there's a boat that's leaving soon for New York. This is not a very interesting cover of Isn't It a Pity, etc. It's wonderful soon. And this is a type sheet that was given to Mitzi by Ira Gershwin of extra lyrics he wrote for the song I Can't Get Started. So these are Ira Gershwin's custom lyrics created for Mitzi Gaynor to sing when she recorded I Can't Get Started. So that's just a little bit of what we have in the archive. And now I'd like to share with you excerpts of an interview I did with Mitzi when she was here because we honored her uh, as one of our Songbook Foundation members. She is part of our Hall of Fame and we treasure our association with her. So now let's hear a little bit from Mitzi. So you have this entire life of an extraordinary contribution to the world of show business. It's true, yeah. what you've done, the arc of your career, is unique and extraordinary because you had an evolution into something that you probably didn't expect would happen when you began, you know, with, with television and with the specials and becoming an icon and a medium that meant n nothing when you first started out. I didn't want to be a radio star. <laughs> well, you couldn't see the legs. I know, I know. No, well, I always wanted to be in the theater, you know. And you worked with the greatest arrangers. I did, didn't I? The greatest musicians. You have... Um, let me start again because I'm blushing. You're not <laughs> blushing at all. Yeah, you're, no, you're looking at me. You're going <laughs> I love you. I love you too. I mean, I really do. You're a wonderful man. I met you in Columbus, Ohio mm -hmm. when I was playing a piano bar at an after party for yep. one of the Kenley Players shows. Yep, that's right. I know it. And uh, I... Did I like you? Did you like me? Oh, of course. No, I was, was that pain though? No, no, no. I was overwhelmed by you. And uh, when I came to California, I... Um, had become friends with a number of your dancers mm -hmm. and and so they took me around and showed me California and and so I have a connection to you that you don't even know about it's because of you being in Columbus and and being there with your troupe and Cindy and the whole group oh my you god know. Cindy yeah I I, uh, I was welcomed to California by, isn't that by all the people who were your sort of your family isn't that nice oh yeah. gosh isn't that the truth though boy yeah. you work with people that really are your family aren't yes. they this is in Mitzi Gaynor's Gershwin, it says. Vernon Gersh Duke. Vernon Duke. Well, that's because you did the first album of the songs of Ira Gershwin. Yes, it is true. And you recorded Vernon Duke's Spring Again. Yes, it's a lovely song, isn't it? Yeah, you, you did the first did. recording of that song. It was I in a did. movie, but you did the first commercial recording of that song. You no, know I think I also did um, You're Nearer Than My Head Is to a Girl. Oh, You're yeah. Nearer. That's Too Many Girls. That's another football movie. Okay, thank you. You're yeah. nearer than my head is to my pillow. Yeah, I did that, oh, too. Yeah. Nice tune. Beautiful. But that's for you. Wow, thank you. That's the envelope of what's inside. Spring Again, that's the yeah, song. Yeah, there it is. Lovely. See, in the movie, it was sung by Kenny Baker, who yeah. did it sten a stentorian. Yes, of course he did. Spring Again, it's time for couples to cling again. And you did it like a real person. I did, didn't I? I'm a real personage. Yeah. Oh, look at these. Oh, my gosh. These are gorgeous. Don't you love the covers? I do, indeed. Especially when you're on them, right? Yeah. <laughs> I did the, the Louisiana person thing? with the original cast, you know. There's Vera, Serena. Oh, you did? Oh, um, on, on, uh, on TV? No, no, no. Oh, on stage? Yeah. With Vera Zarina? Uh-huh. Wow. Irene Bordoni. Billy Irene Gaxton. Irene Bordoni. Billy Gaxton. Oh, my gosh. The original cast, get it? Joke. Oh, <laughs> I uh -huh. thought maybe like years later in their dotage they. Yeah, uh, no, 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 no. So, uh, I think we, I did. It. Well, let's see. I met Mr. Berlin when. It, oh God, this can I tell you one story fast? Please, you can tell um, more than one. Um, waiting for my cue on the other side of the stage. It was a rehearsal. This is Louisiana Purchase. Yeah, 
with the original cast. So where was this at? Los Angeles. At, 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 at the, this, um, the Greek, Civic, Greek C theater no, or downtown? Downtown. downtown. Okay. The, uh, what was it called? Philharmonic. Philharmonic Hall. Yeah. Yeah, very nice looking man's coming down the aisle. But, mm, I don't know who that is. Comes up on the stage. Because I said, hello. And I said, hello. How are you? I said, I'm fine. How are you? I said, I'm Irving Burr. I said, that's great. <laughs> I did. I said, honest to God. I said, listen, how are you? He said, I said, fine, thanks. Excuse me, i got to do, get my cue. Uh -huh, that was it? Yeah. And it, you know what he said afterwards? He said, I wrote a song for this show called um, Louisiana Purchase. I said, yes, I know, sir, I'm in it. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> Virgos, <laughs> right? Yeah. Fifteen, hot, really hot. My, my dancing partner was Tommy Rawls. Do you know Tommy Rawls? Yeah, he's still with us. Yeah, I know he is, yeah. yeah. He was one of the great, all-time greats. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he never charged me for anything. Irving Berlin, ne Irving Berlin never charged you for anything? Uh-uh. Irving Berlin was the cheapest man. He must have really liked you. He did. He did. Every year I'd send him a uh, uh, telegram wishing him a happy birthday. And he'd say, thank you, Miss Gaynor. Oh. So one time, oh, one time, oh, let's say, i got to tell you something. He called me and he said, uh, listen, Shana Gaynor. I said, yes. And he said, um, I saw your show last night. I said, thank you, sir. Did you like it? He said, it's okay. <laughs> he said, I want you to take a, a road company of any to get your gun. I said, I can't. He said, why? I said, because I'm going to do my own show. He said, what's it called? I said, it's a gamer show. It's a clever title. <laughs> <laughs> Cute guy, huh? Cute. Yes. Well, when Rosemary Clooney did an Irving Berlin album. Yeah. He fell in love he, with her. He, he did. Uh, and then she did the album, and he called her up, and he said, uh, and she said, what do you think, Irving? He said, well, there are a couple of things I liked on it. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Don't you love it? That's, yes. I just love it. Don't you? I just love him. Yes. Um, I'll tell you who else is a good friend of mine. Johnny Mercer. Here's two of it. Oh, are you a sweetheart. Lucky? Are Real you sweetheart. Lucky? Well, thank you for sharing your legacy, for giving us treasures that will be appreciated, will be used, will be studied, and will all be used to celebrate you. Thank you, Derek. So Aren't you thank a dear? You. My God. I'm not kidding. He's the finest man I've ever known. God bless you. God bless you, baby. I mean it.